I'm Andrew Bell, and this is Russell Ledney, who's going to be uh, doing the presentation uh, with me because we're lucky to have him over from Sydney for, th for this week. He's been going for three weeks around the world and has just come from Charlotte, North Carolina, where he was uh, at the test facility uh, of uh, where uh, the, the partners of Direct Nickel uh, have been testing their uh, process. And then he came through PDAC in Toronto and then here, so he's looking forward to flying back to Australia to see his family tomorrow morning, but has very kindly come with me today, first to Mindsight this morning and now here uh, to jointly present. And because the two big pieces of news coming up for Regency Mines are first of all going to be the definition of a maiden resource uh, at Membari, then the second development I think is going to be the uh, and the starting of the test work at Direct Nichols uh, pilot plants at the CSIRO facilities in Perth and the listing, probably before that, uh, of Direct Nickel on the ASX. They've reversed into an ASX suspended company and uh, we are shareholders in that company. And uh, so the, the actual listing of that company uh, on the ASX will convert a holding a strategic holding of ours from being an unlisted holding to being a listed one. So those two developments are really important in our immediate future. The maiden resource on Mambari, which is potentially a world-class deposit, one of the, the world's largest uh, lateral nickel deposits, and the uh, listing of DNI with uh, a game-changing uh, technology. And in those circumstances, I'm just going to do a very short introduction and then really hand over to him. So we have two separate presentations running back to back. One a very short Regency one, putting Regency in context, and the other a much longer uh, DNI one, which is still an abbreviated version of the DNI one, which Russell is going to uh, uh, produce. So you have uh, three divisions of Regency mines listed at the beginning of 2005, and uh, we had at that time interests in nickel and copper, and we said we were basically a base metal mine that was going to do transactions. In other words, we had some ambitions, perhaps of where we came from, which was a financial and, uh, in my case, investment banking background. My first job was as a, a mine. I arrived with a history degree, and they made me mining an oil analyst at Morgan Grenfell. Why they did that, I can't think, but in the mid-1970s, I suppose, uh, things were different from now. Now you need a PhD, at least in geology, to have a job like that. So I had some experience of the investment banking field, and we said, yes, we're going to be a mining finance house uh, on a small scale as well as uh, a uh, explorer. And we have, in fact, done some deals from which we've made money, one of which was the uh, acquisition of some iron ore and manganese licenses and floating them out into Red Rock Resources, in which we still have a stake. So we have three divisions, laterally nickel and cobalt in Papua New Guinea, which is now uh, much larger than our other uh, Australian nickel assets. Regency Mines Australasia, uh, which, oh, it does work, uh, which uh, has our interests remaining in Australia, and then mining finance and technology, as we call it. The corp company statistics, uh, that shows the progress in earnings per share, and uh, this shows the progress in pre-tax profits and loss. Because some of our transactions may be one-off transactions that still represent some of the different ways in which companies can close the cycle of taking an early stage project, uh, adding value and disposing it, uh, but maybe one-off events. We think they're still part of the way we operate and are therefore uh, part of our business, but auditors and other people may say no, these are and investors, but an analysts, these are exceptional items. Uh, but I think that the real thing we should be looking at long term and focusing on, and I hope we do, is adding asset value per share. In Papua New Guinea, lateralitic nickel and cobalt. Uh, as I say, this is probably our biggest um, uh, interest at the moment, and the one with the most potential. And uh, we have a uh, license up in Mambari facing the Bismarck Sea on the north side of the Owen Stanley Range, not far from Kokoda. 
And if there are any Australians here or military historians, they will know about the Kokoda Trail and uh, where the Japanese tried to come through, as they had in Malaysia, and take Port Moresby in the back in order to uh, invade Australia. They'd actually started too late because they'd already lost their fleet to the uh, US. Um, but they did it and they were halted by the Australian troops or held up sufficiently to stop their progress. We have quite a large exploration license. This shows the operating uh, structure that we have. We uh, looked at all the nickel technologies in the world and because we knew that with most of the world's nickel being trapped in lateritic deposits which had uh, problems in processing uh, and yet most of the production being in sulfidic deposits which were running out, uh, there was a great <coughs> opportunity if one could uh, get uh, allied with a processing technology that was actually going to work. Because there have been various false gods in that market, of which high-pressure high acid leach was one, and uh, uh, nothing that had really been commercialized that worked. So we looked at the different technologies, and we decided in the end that without a doubt, the uh, direct nickel technology was the one that was going to work, and that was going to be commercialized, and that was, were people that we wanted to work with. It was an added bonus that they happened to be people who knew Papua New Guinea particularly well because the founders of DNI, Russell and his partner Julian Malnick, had been the same two uh, businessmen who started Nautilus Mining, a $450 million company which is going to start subsea mining. Uh, after 50 years of just being a dream, early next year subsea mining will become a reality. And uh, this was their second great vision of something that would be transformative for the nickel market. And so we thought that our uh, asset, which was not as explored to some other people's, would have added value if we were allied to a technology, if we could show how this would be brought into production. And we thought that their technology would also have added value if they had uh, a partially owned resource that they could apply it to. So we formed a 50-50 joint venture with them. And although there were other people that might have had more advanced projects, I'm happy to say uh, that by making ourselves very easy to deal with, by essentially, you have 50% of our project for nothing, and we get a license for your technology, and we form a joint company, we began what has proved to be an extremely productive, and still is a very productive partnership uh, with increasing levels of trust. And uh, we, we carried out a drill program there in uh, 2008 uh, where we identified a lot of the potential but we closed that drill program earlier than expected because of the financial crisis and uh, we took that up again jointly. We could have got a resource then but we were already talking to Direct Nickel. We decided it was better to have a really good uh, drill program to follow up on that and have a much better resource declared at the end of it. CSA should be coming out with a resource within about a month or so which will be a maiden resource for that project and people will then recognize the potential of it. Uh, our Australasian interests consist of our remaining uh, interest in uh, Western Australia. It was nickel potential, also gold potential in greenstone belts there. But as time has gone by we have shifted our attention a bit from the greenstone belts to the uh, geological boundary between the Yilgarn Craton, which is most of whoops, uh, most of Western Australia, and at the southwest there's a boundary with what's called the Albany Fraser metamorphic terrain uh, to the south and east of that. And the Tropicana gold discovery was made there a few years ago. So now Anglo gold has pegged all along there, uh, down to our tenements. And uh, so we conducted some geophysics and exploration there the last uh, two or three years. And we had a significant sulfide discovery uh, from the geophysics and from uh, air core drilling. And we're going to be following that up now. Uh, and we have there. Uh, it's currently uh, a mobile metal iron program taking place at the Pyramid Lake project area which will be followed by air core and RC drilling. And we have to do that right now because they, this is agricultural land and uh, soon they'll be sowing their crops. <coughs> Later in the year, dependent on progress at, at Mambari and other competing demands on our limited budget, uh, we will be looking at drill programs at Cambalda and Bondara. 
Uh, we've also applied for a couple of new projects, one of which was along that uh, boundary with the Albany Fraser metamorphic terrain that's now become very prospective, southwest of Tropicana and northeast of our uh, Pyramid Lake tenement. Uh, it fell vacant and we've pegged it. Another was a little area uh, in Kimberley Downs where a geophysicist working for us pointed out that a tenement with some good lamproites on it uh, next to the Ellendale uh, mine had just become vacant and why didn't we pick it up? So we did. And after I presented at mine site this morning, a lady came up to me and showed me a huge yellow diamond, which she said had come from Ellendale and she'd actually been there and walked over it. So what we want to find there is actually yes. yellow diamonds at Ellendale. Beautiful yellow diamonds from Ellendale. Uh, Tiffany has an agreement with Jen to buy the top end yellows. They're beautiful. Right. And if we find some, we'll have an agreement with you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and so that's the summary of the Australasian uh, projects. Our aim there has been and remains to build up a sufficient uh, critical mass that we can float off uh, Regency Mines Australasia because Australia is a company with so much mining and exploration talent that it doesn't make sense to be trying to run the operations here. Uh, there from here and we have people working there already it's just that market conditions and the stage of maturity of the tenements and the discoveries we've made so far hasn't quite got us to that stage uh, but this is the uh, end game we look for there so that's the uh, project locations what you can see very clearly here which is why we've included this is you can see all the ground pegged by Angrigold de Shanti and I think some by Tech along that geological boundary and there's the Tropicana gold discovery. And uh, this is the phrase of tenements we just applied for, and this is our Pyramid Lake and existing tenements there. And that is uh, a, something showing the VTEM survey and the, the targets we have. Mining finance and technology. We have a, a record of uh, investing in <coughs> companies or helping them to the market, making money out of it. As I said, Red Rock Resources, uh, we uh, floated and our remaining stake there is about four million pounds. The iron ore and manganese assets that we floated that with, we then put uh, most of that into a joint venture with Pallinghurst that we then stuck into Jupiter, where we bought out the major shareholder. And Jupiter is now a $450 million company, $400 million, even though the price has come down in the last year from 70, 80 cents to 20 cents. But in the second half of this year, uh, the cheapy manganese mine in the south uh, Africa in the Kalahari Basin will come into production. That is a, a mine with a 60-year mine life. It's the only remaining large-scale uh, open pit mine uh, of, of that scale in the Kalahari Basin. It's next to Mamatuan uh, of uh, BHP Anglo. And um, it will, whoever has that mine, will be a dominant force in the manganese industry for the next few decades. So um, we're looking forward to that. Uh, originally, the plan had been to open it in the first quarter of this year. But there's been a couple of quarters delay, but uh, the work is going there extremely well. The transportation problems have all been sorted, though that has not been announced because of various uh, confidentiality and competition issues, but it will be. And I think when it is, that will be the start of the recovery in the Jupiter share price. But because over the last year, uh, they've been doing on their two major projects, A, uh, that cheapy, the mine development, and B, at Mount Ida, where we have a royalty in Western Australia, a $50 million bankable feasibility study on that huge iron ore project, that both those things, development and bankable feasibility, means a lot of work, a lot of expenditure, but not much news. And against a poor market background anyway in the last year, this has led to a considerable share price decline in, um, in uh, Jupiter. But we think that will reverse. Uh, at the end of 2010, that was a, uh, a huge investment for Red Rock with 45 million pounds value in the balance sheet. Uh, now it's about 13 million pounds. But when that reverses, that will feed through to Red Rock, which is quite well correlated with the Jupiter share price. And uh, the Regency share price also shows some influence from what happens at Red Rock. So we would hope there'd be some influence there. Oracle Coalfields, we saw this company at a critical stage in its development doing something very interesting, where there's also a possible technology angle. And we like the management very much, so we backed them. 
and that's in coal. Uh, so uh, we have the uh, nickel directly and that will, uh, through our joint venture. Uh, we have the iron ore manganese through Red Rock and coal through Oracle and uh, we try to add value in these. <coughs> uh, direct nickel is, as I say, we have an 8% uh, shareholding there with an estimated value of uh, 4.4 million. I don't know how accurate that will be. And uh, we continue to support them in the run-up to listing in Australia. Uh, Q, uh, we had a small shareholding uh, out in, as an investment. We'll be selling that when UEC take them over at the end of this month and getting a couple of hundred thousand pounds in. And uh, we had a strategic uh, stake in Alba that had some other nickel assets in Europe. Uh, and that remains as um, an investment. Firstly, um, I'm delighted to uh, meet uh, an awful lot of uh, people, uh, some of whom have made direct contact with me at Direct Nickel uh, over the years. And uh, uh, tonight uh, is going to be a great opportunity to um, to get to know you, uh, know you better. Now, um, I, I did wonder when I came over here why Andrew was uh, willing to share uh, valuable time on the podium uh, with me uh, uh, here uh, on a relatively short visit from Sydney. Uh, of course, it is based on the, uh, the closest of possible uh, relationships which uh, Andrew has described, but it's also due to the fact that as a private company, of course, and until we're listed, the only way that you can invest in direct nickel, of course, is to buy Regency shares. And uh, we all know that Andrew is not one to miss an opportunity. So, uh, Andrew, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm into your game. I just want you to know that. <laughs> the uh, basis of our partnership, of course, is, uh, is the Mambari uh, deposit in, in Papua New Guinea. And you've all seen uh, that, that uh, picture before. But I've put a nice uh, big round circle around what is, in fact, the plateau area on that deposit. And that's a, an 80 square mile area. Uh, of a total of uh, 100 uh, squ sorry, square kilometres of a total of 100 square kilometres uh, in that particular concession. We're only just uh, literally uh, beginning to start to uh, get out into uh, that part uh, of, the, uh, of, of the deposit and already we're finding some fantastic grades. <clears throat> and the importance of that of course is that uh, it's starting to bear out the, the uh, uh, proposition that was put by Anaconda, that was Twiggy Forest's uh, a company uh, uh, you may recall before it became Manara, um, the, uh, the proposition that the Mambari deposit could hold somewhere between five and seven million tonnes of contained nickel. Now, uh, not only would that make it a world-class resource by any standards, but the interesting thing was that they had only drilled into the limonite layer of the deposit and hadn't in fact got down to the richer saprolite. So we really don't know how big it's going to be. What we do know is that the drill results that we're getting are beginning to indicate that that could be a monster. Drilling uh, has just completed. Those of you who follow uh, Regency will have seen the, uh, the RNSs coming through. We've <coughs> now uh, filed the last of those uh, and that uh, process is being led by Ian Warden from uh, Direct Nickel. Uh, Ian has done, done a terrific job and right now in fact he's in Perth uh, putting the uh, resource estimate and resource statement together with CSA and we're expecting that that will be out probably, as Andrew said, within the next month. Some of the grades uh, that we're getting, uh, and some of you uh, will have seen these numbers, but let's repeat them because they are worthy of repeating. I'll just refer to some of the grades, and these are, these are reasonable intercepts, by the way. 2.82%, 1.74%, 2.04%, 2.23%. These are big numbers. They're seriously big numbers. They're sort of numbers in the the best of the Philippines or the, the Indonesian grades. And what it says is this deposit is likely to be a big one. Now, I'll say something about the relevance of the limonite and the saprolite in a moment when I tell you a little bit about, about direct nickel. But first, the deposit is really, really well situated. As Andrew said, it's very close to uh, very good infrastructure in Kokoda. It's close to the coast, about 120 uh, kilometres away by paved and or bitumen road. Um, if uh, it does have uh, significant reserves, we know that it's going to be worth around about $20 billion for every 1 million tonnes of nickel in the ground. It's a seriously big deposit by any standards. A total of 735 holes have been drilled and the current 135 drill program uh, is, means that we will have a jork resource 
uh, by probably, um, I would hope, within the next three weeks, but let's, uh, let's say within the next month. Now, I'm often asked, what is a nickel laterite? Some people think it's just nickel in the ground, just like any other deposit, but in fact, it's the very interesting differentiation that occurs in a nickel laterite layer that actually provided the opening for direct nickel. Nickel laterites are made up of a top layer of limonite. I'll just press the button here. No, I'll... Sorry, I'm, I'm as bad as you, Andrew, when it comes to pressing these damn things. There we are. A top layer of limonite, which is in the top section of the, uh, of the, uh, of the deposit, and, uh, and, and a lower um, section of saprolite. The, the limonite is iron rich. The lower section is magnesium rich. And by the way, that's a deposit in Brazil, and we're probably looking at around about a 50 metre uh, profile there. And that's fairly typical of laterite resources. Now, that's particularly important because it's that difference that occurs in laterites that means that processing for so many years now has been a major difficulty. Currently, to use existing processes, if you want to process the iron-rich layer, you have to use a high-pressure acid leach system or some other acid system. And if you want to, use, if you want to treat the bottom half, then you need to use a ferro-nickel uh, uh, process or a pyro process. And the reason for that is because the iron-rich layer, of course, has the effect of clogging up the, uh, the furnaces and therefore is perhaps suitable for direct shipping to China where they make uh, pig nickel. But uh, it's generally not uh, capable of being processed by ferro-nickel processes. And because there's so much magnesium in the saprolite, it means that you can't use the acid processes because it would simply gobble up far too much acid. And uh, as a result of that, if you have a nickel laterite deposit that's likely to come into production, you've immediately got the decision of what process you have to, uh, that you might use. And then, on top of that, you've got the question of how is the process going to work. And we'll say a little bit more about the failures uh, that have occurred in relation particularly to HPAL and the other processing methods as we go along. Now, laterites are really, really easy to discover. In fact, the world has something like 150 years of projected supply in laterites. What's happening is that the world's supply of laterites that are currently being, uh, being supported by sulphides are actually, is actually running down. Sulphides probably comprise now only about 30% of the world's laterite supply, yet they supply 60% of the world's laterite demand. The future of the world, uh, insofar as its uh, requirements for nickel is concerned, is in laterites. And yet we have this major technical blockage that's occurred and major difficulties due to the capital that's required to use those existing processes. Most of the um, world's laterites are in the tropical areas. That's because they are the result of a weathering process that occurs. If you can imagine it, laterites are what's left after everything else is leached away. And generally what's left are the refractory elements, iron, magnesium, uh, aluminium, and of course nickel and cobalt. So as a result of that, they tend to occur in these sort of island areas. And in fact, oops, and in fact some uh, some 70% of the world's laterite are in that Southeast Asian and Australasian region. Now I mentioned earlier that um, you needed to choose your process. And you can see there on that, uh, on that uh, drawing, on the left hand side of the, of the numbers that are there, we've got the iron rich uh, limonite at the top, the magnesium rich saprolite at the bottom. For the top part there you use your high pressure acid leach uh, technology. <coughs> For the bottom part, you would use your uh, ferro-nickel technology. The direct nickel process treats the entire profile using the same flow sheet. And that is an absolute breakthrough. It basically means not only are we talking about a processing breakthrough, but we're also talking about a mining breakthrough. Because what's currently happening in these areas where uh, nickel laterites are being produced is where, they've, where they're producing with ferro-nickel, they're having to stockpile the limonite. Where they're producing with HPAL, they're having to leave the saprolite in the ground. And so you can imagine, therefore, that uh, not only are mining costs often much greater, but often the resource itself is not fully <coughs> exploited. Now, what is it about the direct nickel process that uh, makes the difference? Well, instead of uh, existing uh, hydrometallurgical processes which use sulfuric acid, we use nitric acid. And nitric is not an acid that's used commercially 
in the mining industry or generally speaking in any other industry. A couple of reasons for that. Nitric is very, very expensive. Nitric is something like five to six times the price of the, of the current uh, sulphur price. But just as importantly, if not more importantly, if you do use nitric acid, then when it reacts, it gives off nitrous and nitrate gases, which we call NOx gases. And those NOx gases are, are toxic, and you have to either capture them and retain them, or capture them and, uh, and neutralize them in some way. And that it is, a, is a, an extremely difficult uh, exercise and, uh, and something that uh, generally means that the, the acid, despite all of its uh, success uh, in leaching and despite all of the wonderful kinetics that enable it to, uh, uh, to, to create that particular miracle, uh, is not generally used. When we do use uh, nitric in the DNI process, we recover 90 to 95 percent of, uh, of the nickel. In fact, I have to say most of the tests have uh, revealed that it's closer to 95 percent. And in fact, in the case of the Mambari deposit, we actually got better than 95 percent recovery. And that's done in one to four hours residence time. And for those of you who follow uh, the emerging technologies in nickel, and are perhaps interested in the future of technologies such as heap leach, you might want to consider that the average heap leach uh, does a job where it recovers 70 percent of, uh, of the nickel in somewhere between nine and 14 months. We're talking one to four hours. So uh, a much lower technical intensity because we don't have uh, the, uh, the high pressure and the high temperatures that are involved uh, in, in, in high pressure acid leach or, or for that matter in a ferro-nickel process with a smelter. And let me put that into context. If you want to use sulfuric acid, a lazy acid, you have to actually energize it by heating it to 250 degrees centigrade and you have to apply 50 atmospheres of pressure. And when you do that, the sulfuric acid will deal with the limonite, but it still won't deal with the saprolite. We don't have anything like that. We've got an atmospheric uh, 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 process that uh, resides in uh, stainless steel tanks and uh, uh, doesn't have anything like that operating intensity. If you want to build a, um, a ferro-nickel plant or a, or a high-pressure acid leach plant, Generally speaking, you've got a, an entry threshold due to the economies of scale that are required. In the case of ferro-nickel, it's thought to be around about 20 to 30,000 tonnes per annum. In the case of high-pressure acid leach, all, all I can say is that the most recent uh, uh, plants that have been commissioned are in the 50,000 tonnes per annum size. So you're talking about enormous amounts of capital involved in, uh, in those, uh, in those uh, alternatives. We produce a mixed hydroxide product. Uh, that's uh, 40 to 45 percent uh, nickel and cobalt, uh, and that's generally uh, available for sale at about 75 percent of LME. So we're talking about a valuable product, uh, easily saleable, and uh, and 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 obtaining a very uh, effective price. Now, excuse me. Here's the uh, the DNI flow sheet. Um, which has been uh, on our website and I know many of you have uh, studied it uh, intently. I don't intend to uh, spend uh, too much time going through the technicalities. I just want to make the point that taking ore supply, it goes into the leach tanks. It, uh, the residence time, as I mentioned, is between one and four hours in the nitric acid. There's a solid liquid separation phase before we have an iron hydrolysis stage. Um, uh, let me try to put this in, in really simple terms before we start uh, to get too technical about it. Nitric acid has the wonderful property that it takes just about everything into solution. That's why it works so well. It doesn't have any difficulty with the magnesium, which would normally be a, uh, a neutralising agent. It takes everything into solution, and then, in simple chemistry sets style, by simply adjusting pH and adjusting temperature, you're able to selectively drop out each of the payable metals. And because everything goes into solution and is in any way destroyed or changed, what you're basically doing is taking everything into solution and then dropping everything out. So we drop out the iron, we then drop out the aluminium, if there is a, a, a high degree of aluminium, some uh, products uh, or, or some uh, specifications means you can leave some of it in. And we produce uh, a nickel cobalt uh, precipitate, as I said, which is 40 to 45 percent down here. And at that point in time, with our payable product uh, bagged and uh, off to market, we're left with the last of the refractory elements that needs to, be, needs to be dealt with. Happily, that refractory element is magnesium, and it's uh, at that stage a magnesium nitrate solution. That solution is dried, turned into a crystalline form, 
put through a, uh, a thermal decomposition unit, which is this unit here. The NOx gases come off. We don't have any problem with the NOx gases. In fact, on the contrary, we want all of the NOx gases because it's the NOx gases that are recycled right back to the beginning of the process. Uh, and we're going to recycle, we think, commercially about 96% of the nitric acid that goes into the, uh, into the process. Um, and that will go back at a 55% strength, which is more than what you need, in fact, at the beginning of the process. So um, comparing the direct nickel process, just with that short summary, with high pressure acid leach, um, high pressure acid leach using sulfuric acid will use somewhere between a half a tonne to a tonne of sulfuric acid per tonne of ore that it processes. The direct nickel process will use between 30 and 50 kilograms of acid when you take the net effect of the recycle. So in one sense, I suppose, the reagent or the acid is almost a capital expense in the plant. Um, there's another important thing, uh, of course, in relation to recycling. Uh, one of the big problems, and increasingly so in mining, and especially in developing countries, and especially developing countries in the tropics, uh, is how to, uh, how to deal with your tailings uh, that you, uh, that you generate uh, in the mining operation. Uh, in the case, again, of uh, high pressure acid leach, and I'm not so much down on that, we wish them well, but uh, they generate about 120% of the ore that they put in, in waste and, and tailings that has to go out to the tailings dam. And although that's neutralised, uh, over time, with uh, rainfall, especially in those areas, they certainly constitute a hazard. In the case of the direct nickel process, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment, um, what we actually put out are nitrates. And if any of you um, uh, are keen gardeners, you'll know that uh, nitrates are precisely the things you need to help make things grow. Uh, so we're actually very happy with what we actually produce and put out in the tailing stand. I mentioned that we produced uh, the various products. Uh, what I didn't say was that uh, we're producing a high quality hematite as the iron product. In some places that may be a co-product that uh, would be uh, particularly uh, uh, lucrative if it was sold. We're also producing mag magnesium oxide. Magnesium oxide is um, actually, um, again, another pure product. Again, with a hydrometallurgical process, everything that comes out is pure. It doesn't have any contaminants in it. The magnesium uh, is actually critical to the process for a, a range of reasons. Um, not only is it uh, available at the end of the process to, uh, to do a little neutralising if we wish to do so, magnesium has what they call colliquity properties, which means that uh, we can uh, heat uh, the, uh, the, uh, the initial leach stage to about 160 degrees without it boiling. And uh, that's because you add magnesium and it has the effect of essentially raising the boiling point. So once again, that's part of the reason why we've got an atmospheric process. So once again, yet another box ticked. I think everyone understands uh, what nickel's used for. Um, Andrew tells me he likes this, uh, this particular slide for the uh, bus shelter uh, there in New Delhi. Um, what it, of course, demonstrates is that nickel is not only a strategic metal, but particularly in developing countries, it's being used increasingly. And uh, uh, by any measure, uh, particularly with the sulphide resources running down, uh, the world's going to be looking to nickel laterites not only to fill that uh, shortfall, but also the shortfall that uh, is bound to occur uh, with increasing demand in developing countries. Uh, it's been estimated, uh, not by me, but by analysts, that the world needs a new 50,000 tonne production uh, plant of, uh, of nickel every year to keep pace with projected world demand. And of course, it's not happening. Uh, and part of the reason it's not happening is because of the uh, major technological problems that have occurred with HPAL and the high capital cost associated with both HPAL and ferro-nickel. Um, a little on the, um, a little on the, uh, on the uh, environmental uh, consequences, lots of words there. I'll jump quickly from those to my, uh, my little uh, garden that we have here. On the right hand side, in fact they're actually three pots together. On the right hand side, that's what happens when you grow snow peas uh, in 100% direct nickel tailings. I have to tell you, it's not doing quite as well as I hoped it would do. <laughs> uh, but the reason for that, of course, is there's too much nitrogen in, the, in that uh, particular part of the, uh, the tailings. Uh, when you um, grow it in mulch, you can see it on the left-hand side, but look how well it's doing with the 50% mulch and the 50% tailings. I guess that only just emphasises the point that what we're talking about here is not only 
an effective process from a technological point of view, but we're talking about a process that ticks the boxes when it comes to environmental soundness. And uh, these days, there are very few things that are more important. Now, in the mining industry, and I suspect it's probably true of any other uh, industry too, um, it's, all about, it's all about cost. And um, in the course of developing the direct nickel process and going through the stages that we've gone through, uh, you know, all the bench testing, all the microplant work, all of the testing of each of the individual elements, and now, as you'll see, if you haven't already seen, uh, building a, uh, a, uh, a demonstration plant to run it continuously, We've done uh, studies, and those studies have been done uh, by uh, independent consultants on, uh, on uh, in, in this case, uh, Australian uh, located uh, resources. And uh, what we've learned is that the direct nickel process is going to come in at something less than 40% of the capital cost of a competing process. And I'm not just talking high pressure acid lease here, I'm talking high pressure acid lease, I'm also talking ferro nickel plants. So at $12.50 per annual pound of capacity, the direct nickel process certainly beats the $35, uh, dollars, uh, and that's uh, certainly going up at the moment, uh, of, uh, of, of per pound of annual capacity for both HPAL and ferro-nickel. There are some places, certainly, where it's, uh, where it's proved a little cheaper, but we're talking here uh, pretty much average prices. And before I get off CapEx, <clears throat> I want to make the point that uh, those uh, other processes, because of their high threshold, means that they require an awful lot of capital. If you're going to build a 35,000 tonne plant or a 50,000 or a 60,000 tonne plant, which is exactly what Extrata and Vale are doing in New Caledonia at the moment, then you need one hell of amount of capital. Uh, in fact, Vale have, uh, have, have still not commissioned uh, Goro fully and it's about four and a half billion dollars. Uh, Extrata are, uh, are still building Coniambo, which is a ferro-nickel plant, and they're at $5.9 billion and still spending. We can build plants for direct nickel as small as 5,000 tonnes per annum. And we've done studies to prove that they will be profitable at that level. And at 5,000 tonnes per annum, uh, or, or 10,000 tonnes per annum, which I think would be about the size of the first plant, we're probably looking at something at around about $300 million versus the four and the $5 billion that are involved. Now, the relevance, the relevance of that, of course, is that the world is full of stranded laterite deposits which are very lowly priced at the moment. The reason they're lowly priced, of course, is because there's no technological uh, solution, no solution that will enable them to go from mining all the way through to, um, uh, through to production. Well, um, at, these sorts of, um, at these sorts of numbers, and given the size of the plant, and the ability to be able to generate uh, uh, bigger plants uh, from the, the cash flow that's developed, uh, we're talking about essentially opening up all of those, uh, all of those stranded resources and in the case of Direct Nickel's business model, revaluing those, those, uh, those resources up to the same value as sulphide resources are valued at now, i.e. about 30 to 50 times the value. Now, operating cost uh, is also another breakthrough. Um, I didn't prepare this slide. Had I done so, I might have been just a little bit more conservative on some of the other operating costs. Um, they're generally regarded as being around about $5.50 per pound. Uh, the $8 per pound was recently announced by Monara uh, in Australia. Monara probably is, at the moment, uh, one of the very few companies that's actually made HPAL work. It's taken them an awful long time, but they've recently announced that they're running close to $8 per pound. The nickel price today, I think, is something uh, slightly in excess of $9 per pound. So they're bumping up against the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the point where uh, even a successfully run uh, facility uh, is likely to prove uneconomic. We're coming in at $1.83 a pound, and that's in an Australian setting. Uh, that figure will be reduced in the Philippines or in Indonesia, or in, for that matter, in uh, Papua New Guinea. So um, after uh, what has been five or six years of fairly heavy lifting, but at the same time ticking every box that you need to tick to bring a new process to, uh, to the mining world, we're at the stage where we built a demonstration plant uh, in Perth. Now this plant will, um, will endure, it's, uh, it's not only for the purposes of proving up the technology and by the way just to be clear on that, the final step is you have to run uh, in continuous lock cycle um, the, uh, the process for a period of time sufficient to be able to demonstrate its effect on materials of construction, uh, that your materials handling uh, uh, is, is fine, that the, any of the bespoke uh, uh, elements in the, in the process flow sheet operate appropriately. But you also want to generate 
the, um, the financial and technical data that would be needed to design the first plant. This plant uh, is uh, now all but uh, constructed. We've got two elements to include in that yet. Uh, we're arranging funding for that and uh, I'm happy to say that uh, we're talking uh, again with uh, Andrew about uh, uh, Regency providing uh, further assistance, of course, for uh, a reasonable price. And, uh, and we're hoping to add the, uh, the iron and the aluminium steps over the, next, uh, over the next month or two. You'll note that the facility is located uh, in the uh, CSIRO facility in, uh, in Australia. For those who don't know, CSIRO is Australia's preeminent uh, government uh, uh, owned uh, scientific organisation. The direct nickel uh, process development is a flagship project, uh, and in fact, CSIRO are an investor in direct nickel. They actually hold shares and uh, have recently turned up uh, just three weeks ago uh, with a further uh, $2.1, $2.3 million investment in direct nickel uh, to help us uh, into this uh, final stage. So um, the process uh, is certainly very much at an advanced stage and we are uh, now measuring the delivery uh, date in months and certainly not years. I'm still pressing this button, there we go. Our strategy, uh, I think you um, probably will have gathered by now, is to prove up the process and at the same time to accumulate nickel resources in the ground. Uh, and to that extent, of course, we have our first joint venture with, uh, with uh, Regency Mines. Uh, the joint venture is working uh, extremely well. Direct Nickel is playing a leading role along with uh, uh, Andrew's uh, mining people in uh, undertaking the drilling program and doing the resource uh, estimate and that uh, cooperation, as Andrew said, uh, is increasing in trust and confidence and uh, we only see that uh, going from strength to strength. We'll uh, only be, uh, in the case of the Direct Nickel model, licensing projects with the DNI process uh, in circumstances where we have an interest in the project. And the reason for that, uh, apart from not wanting to um, drive the nickel price to the ground uh, if uh, the process uh, is as effective as we claim it to be, is to ensure that that revaluation that occurs in those stranded nickel laterite resources, you can pick them up uh, if you want to go and buy one for literally just a few cents a pound. Uh, and uh, and uh, we know uh, that those, those resources are, uh, are going to be revalued and indeed I suspect have been revalued in the case of the Mambari resource because there is a pathway to production. Unless you're a very big company with a very big balance sheet, it doesn't matter how much drilling you do, it doesn't matter how much grade you have, unless you, unless you have a pathway to production, uh, and that means a process, then those assets are going to remain stranded. So obviously then, to become a major nickel producer, our uh, target uh, for direct nickel uh, is to uh, produce somewhere between 150 to 200,000 tonnes of nickel per annum. Uh, that will make us the third or fourth biggest uh, nickel producer in the world. Uh, but even that amount is still something uh, less than about 10% of annual world production. So it's not so big as to uh, disrupt the nickel price, but it'll certainly disrupt, I think, any decisions that might be made in the boardrooms in the future as to what sort of technology might be used. I can't imagine a board making a decision to build a high-pressure acid leach plant uh, when we're talking about that sort of difference in terms of capital costs. So the dual turbines are obviously having the, uh, the nickel inventory and revaluing that and then of course delivering the process and the process itself will have a value. Partners, uh, apart from Regency Mines that you see mentioned there, we have uh, Tech uh, Resources. Uh, tech uh, was an investor uh, as was uh, CSIRO I might add as well as a technical partner in my previous uh, company Nautilus Minerals. Um, they followed us into, uh, into this company uh, and have provided uh, a deal of uh, technical support. Unfortunately, they're like all big companies. They love junior companies to take all of the risk and find all of the money. But nevertheless, uh, we uh, are also talking to them at the moment and we feel that they're going to stump up uh, for, the, uh, for the next stage and the final stage of the process uh, demonstration. Oz Minerals was form formerly Oxiana. They were actually the first to come in. Uh, they uh, hit the wall, of course, during the uh, GFC and were split up. And uh, what's left in Oz now, in fact, is a gold a copper gold company, <clears throat> so as a result of that no interest in nickel and their nickel assets went with the Chinese to min metals and uh, needless to say we're extremely protective of our IP so as a result <laughs> of that we uh, chose to uh, leave that particular relationship alone. Um, I think on this particular uh, bridge presentation I don't have my normal IP slide and uh, I'm often asked and uh, indeed many of you have asked me what our IP strategy is and I should just quickly say that 
uh, uh, we have a very uh, well uh, run and, and well planned IP strategy. The initial recycle patent uh, has not been challenged since 2001 uh, and it was around that patent with our American partners out of Charlotte, North Carolina that we actually built the process. But since then we've registered patents uh, around the world on a country by country basis for uh, the process as a whole. So uh, generally speaking anyone who wants to use nitric acid uh, who wants to recycle nitric acid, remember I said you can't use it if you can't recycle it, uh, who wants to use nitric acid to produce uh, laterites uh, has uh, a suite of patents uh, to deal with. And of course there's also a great deal of trade secrets and know-how that you'd expect any technology to company to have which uh, sits outside that but which, uh, which uh, operates in tandem with it. Um, our uh, course uh, has been a, uh, a fairly, um, fairly well-planned and uh, I might say well-executed course. So far, um, no red flags. Um, this process does tick all of the boxes. The engineers have tried very, very hard to find out what might go wrong. We've done every step. The most important step, the recycle step, we did at scale in Charlotte, North Carolina just over a year ago. And we showed then that we can actually recycle 99 point something percent of the acid at that 55% strength. That was done at uh, commercial demonstration scale, same sort of scale as we've got for the demonstration plan as a whole. So uh, we're feeling very confident uh, that this process uh, is, uh, is ready to uh, come to the market. As you'd expect, uh, uh, the usual uh, range of, of, of good people, perhaps with the exception of the second guy from the top, the, um, my partner Julian Melnick is a geologist. Julian and I, uh, uh, as um, I think Andrew mentioned, uh, started uh, Nautilus Minerals back in the, uh, the mid-90s. Uh, that was a good idea at the time and continues to be a good idea. And uh, just quietly between us here, uh, this is a better one. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, Graham Brock is uh, a, a metallurgist, great deal of uh, nickel laterite experience, uh, <coughs> formerly from Lion Ore, uh, an Englishman who's uh, successfully, uh, I think over the last 30 years, uh, turned himself into an Australian. So much so that uh, when uh, England are playing Australia in cricket or rugby, he supports Australia. So that's a very strange thing. Very strange. Very strange. Richard Carlton, an another Englishman, but I th I'm not quite sure about his allegiance. Uh, uh, I, must, I must review his contract when I get back. Uh, Ian Bain, uh, uh, because we're talking here about uh, growing a significant uh, organisation, uh, formerly um, uh, Global Head of Mining and Metals uh, Corporate Finance for ABN AMRO, so we've got good people who know what they're doing, who know what the, uh, the business uh, is. And uh, I think as Andrew has indicated, we form good partnerships with uh, good people and we make them work. Now, just ignore the uh, dates, if you will, at the top. This slide's a year old and it really should say 2016, 2017, 2018. But the, the relevant thing here is to get an idea of what uh, something like this could be worth. And, and by the way, for those of you who might be thinking of investing uh, further in uh, Regency mines. Uh, this is, of course, the sorts of numbers that would apply for a project using the direct nickel process. So what we're talking about at the top, whoops, what we're talking about at the top there is a, um, a, uh, a production, nickel production of 20,000 tonnes per annum. With the DNI process and with these metrics here and a PE multiple of 10, some people might think that's a bit ambitious, some people might think it's not enough, that project will have a value of $1.55 billion. If uh, you get out to 90,000 uh, tonnes of production, and Andrew, I think your licence, uh, or our licence, yeah. the joint venture licence, I think permits us to go to about 80, is it, or 90? I forgot. 90, I think. 90,000? That might be the reason why we put 90 in the yeah, slide. probably is. <laughs> $6.4 billion. You know, we're talking about very, very large resources. We're talking about strategic metals. We're talking about uh, projects that uh, are significant by any world scale. And, uh, and clearly they have that sort of value. So that's uh, in one sense I suppose the, uh, the direct nickel uh, uh, story. Um, I, uh, I have to say that uh, if uh, we have uh, as many successful projects as we do uh, currently with, uh, with Regency, it's a story that uh, you're going to hear a great deal more about. And apropos that, just to correct one uh, thing Andrew said, we haven't yet backed the company into the, um, into the uh, reverse takeover vehicle. We've had it, we have it in our control, uh, we're ready to do that, but uh, I have to tell you the last four months in the capital markets, uh, if you don't already know that, have been extremely difficult and one of the things we do not want to do is to abandon our existing shareholders or new shareholders to the uh, volatility in the market. 
Um, so we've taken the RTO just a little bit slowly, but we will go ahead and complete that because as a private company, we are severely constrained uh, from raising capital. We can't make an offer to the public, and in Australia, we can't even have more than 50 shareholders. So going public is something which we will do. We'll probably hold on the listing until t such time as things actually uh, stabilise and we're able to go to the market with a public offering at that stage, which I hope uh, many of you will be interested in investing in, uh, and that will, of course, uh, help uh, underwrite the share price for all of us. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's great to be back in England. I actually lived here for four years, uh, many years ago, when I was working in the offshore oil and gas industry, and uh, I, uh, I love coming to the old art, I have to tell you. So uh, thanks very much indeed. Oh, thank you.